wanted to start with the same first slide to give credit again to many people uh, whose slides also I am using and uh, say that we have this group which we are calling the Nexus group and uh, you'll hear a little bit more about this group again but uh, it wants to address all the 17 sustainable development goals of United Nations and use uh, energy as part of the solution. And I just want to recap last time spoke about, I want to focus on nuclear now, this, this talk. This talk will be really focused on nuclear. And it may sound as if I don't like renewables and the context, I don't like them for the base load of Africa. If you want renewables in an um, isolated situation, remote situation, local situation, that's fine. I wanted to be very clear that I don't see that as the topic of this talk because this talk is to make Africa wealthy. If Africa is going to be wealthy, we want to have the same energy per capita as America. If we have the same per capita energy of America, we need 20 times more energy in Africa, 20 to zero. We need a lot. America's only got 300 million people. Africa's got over 1 billion. So we will need a lot of energy. When, when you look at this picture with the globe and you see how lighted up is Europe, then you imagine how many kilowatts there are per individual in Europe compared to Africa. So in this context where we want a lot of energy, that's where I don't think renewables are going to deliver the goods, okay? But if someone wants to put renewables on their house or there's a very remote hospital, fine. But don't say renewables is the solution for base load capacity. That's the distinction that I want to make. So last time I felt maybe um, someone misunderstood the renewables people, please let them have their renewables, but don't let them pretend it's going to solve the problem for Af Africa. So that's, I, I just want to jump now straight to my slide now. Um, is this was, I believe my last slide of last time where we are really looking for a solution for Africa and where Africa needs to think Pan-Africa and regional. So now we come to part two. In part two, I will focus on nuclear energy. We always say nuclear energy in the mix, meaning there's a mix of energy. And we want to answer the question, I can tell you it will be yes. Can it power Africa sustainably? The answer will be yes, of course. But I'm going to look at large reactors, small modular reactors, micro reactors, tutti frutti. And I'm also going to introduce a concept that's new, which is not just energy to make into electrical energy, but process heat. So I also want to focus on those things. And so far, if I again summarize the take-home message from the first talk, our take-home message, renewables are nice, but they are not dispatchable. Meaning, if I go and push my finger on the light switch, I might not get light. Why? The sun might not shine, the wind might not blow. So, I want to push my finger on the light switch and get light. 
you can't go to a mine and say, sorry, folks, I uh, must leave 3,000 miners down for another day because we don't have electricity. No one will build you a mine under those circumstances. So we must understand um, renewables need 100% backup, not 50% backup, not 10% backup, 100% backup. Even in Germany where they boast sometimes that three days a year, they had 100% of their electricity renewables there was also three days per year where they didn't boast and didn't even say where they had 0% of their electricity from renewables. Then they needed 100% backup. So even if it's only three days a year, you need 100% backup. Could be storage or whatever backup you need. In uh, South Africa, they talk open cycle gas turbine hydro, uh, pump storage, and also batteries. But 100%. Then the other thing that uh, renewable people forget is that they're more reliant on the grid. Why? Because they need to do handover a lot. Renewable load factor is 20%. That means 80% of the time, they're not running at capacity. When that happens, they borrow. It's blowing there, but not here, or blowing here, but not there. So renewables need the grid more than base load dispatchable. So renewables actually put more strain on the grid and need more grid investment. <clears throat> okay, so harvested diffuse resource. And then I just want to emphasize, we are not talking of impoverished third world Africa. No, we're talking of wealthy Africa. If we do wealthy Africa, we want 3,400 gigawatts, three terawatts per hour produced there in Africa. That's what we want. And, and now I just want to say renewables, which are harvesting a diffuse resource. If you now say, folks, we want to put renewables down at three terawatts, you are really talking of enormous plant. That's a conclusion. Renewable have their place. Renewables have their place, but it's not base load. So please, here we are talking of base load. Now here we zoom into nuclear. We must have carbon free, okay? And so we can either have hydro or nuclear. Now, <clears throat> let's look at the people who have carbon free. You can see um, who's ever claiming to have carbon free, they could do hydro, nuclear, wind, or solar. They must have a very small green, which is the fossil fuel. There you see the countries, the foremost carbon free is the ones with nuclear, unless you really are lucky with a lot of hydrogen, with a lot, okay? So we really see your options are nuclear or hydro, nuclear or hydro, folks. Now, let's zoom to Africa. I just want you to really appreciate our continent. We have this river called the Congo River. It is the world's most potent river. Take the whole planet, ask where is the most potent river? Come to Africa. Now, there are plans that you could dam this river. Even if you don't dam it, you could put turbines directly in the river flow. No dam, directly in the river flow. And you would come to this region, very pretty, see on the right, is 15 kilometers of rapids. You could just put turbines in the river flow and you can pull off 39 gigawatts from that river. Doesn't even cost a lot, $80 billion, very cheap um, uh, if you compare. And then you could put it on the grid, take it to Africa, $10 billion. Now in 1997, 
when there was the first study about this, that 39 gigawatts was the entire Africa consumption. You could have with impoverished Africa, powered Africa from this one river. But I just want to tell you, we are not talking of impoverished Africa. 39 gigawatts would be the largest ever hydropower project on planet Earth, okay? So it's impressive, 39 gigawatts, but it's still less than 3,400 gigawatts. It's 10 times too little. So giant as this river is, it's not going to do the job, folks. It's not going to do the job. We must be realistic. We must think in scale. If you want to say, oh, don't worry, we will save power. When you save power, you can save percents, like 10% or 20%. But when you compare that, that we want 20 times more, it looks a bit silly to be saving percents. No, you have to build enormous amount of power if you believe in wealthy Africa. So I, I just like you to see, let's close the chapter on hydro. Nice as this river is, a, a lot of um, green people love this river because if you look at it very carefully, you'll see it splits. There's actually a fork. Is some goes left and some goes right. And so you could put the hydro as the Inga project, Grand Inga want to do, you put the hydro on the left-hand fork and all the fish can still swim in the other one. And so it's like nature is making this the most convenient place to put a dam because you can still have your normal river flow as nature ever intended and you won't interrupt any life cycles of fish and so on. So this is probably the best potential hydropower project in the world. Yes, we should do it, but keep in mind, even though it's the best and the biggest and the most potent, it's still way too small, folks, 10 times too small for Africa. Now it's NEPAD's top project, okay, NEPAD, new something for Africa development, whatever. NEPAD's uh, uh, really, really, really keen on this project, but Is the communication okay? No, I've lost him too. Yeah, that's Simon, so, we lost you for a moment. Could you restart like from a minute ago? Right. Yeah. He's saying reload. Oh, repeat. Repeat. Okay, so <laughs> I. I don't know if you heard, I said that this Grand Inga power project, um, it is potentially the most massive hydropower project on planet Earth. It's not built, but it's double as big as the current biggest dam, which is the Chinese one. And it, it, it could be the biggest dam in Africa by factor two. And you don't even have to really dam because it can be run off river. And the river splits in two. So it doesn't make a big impact on the environment. Fish can still swim up and down as much as they like on the other side. The, have we done enough on this hydro, folks? Hello, Kitevi? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, so, so Kitevi, I was just wanting to conclude from this slide that we are looking at the best hydropower project on the earth, but it's not going to save Africa. That's why I want to conclude that because Africa needs 10 times this amount of power. Okay, I hope you heard me. Yes. And now I want to go to Egypt. I, I want to go to Egypt. Egypt is currently using 31 gigawatts, very similar to South Africa. 
So uh, Egypt could be completely satisfied with the Grand Inga hydropower and more. Um, but Egypt is using 31 gigawatts, okay? And on the right, it's showing you the mix for Egypt, of which you see fossil fuels, gas, and oil. And only 8% is uh, environment uh, friendly for, for Egypt, okay? But um, Egypt is going nuclear, and they start next year with construction. 4.8 gigawatts, and it will be finished in 2026, 4.8 gigawatts. And I want to talk a bit about the Egypt situation. What lessons are there for Africa? First, you see that Egypt had its atomic energy authority uh, since about 70 years, 65 years. More than half a century, Egypt has atomic energy authority. It is apparently takes about 10 years to have such an atomic energy authority. No one may sell nuclear power to a country at the moment if they don't have such a regulator. And, and Egypt has had such a regulator for a long time. It is therefore considered safe by the IAEA. There's lots more to say on Egypt signing non-proliferation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think you still see the very deep roots of nuclear energy in Egypt. And then the next milestone is they signed with Russia in 2015, uh, committing $60 billion to four nuclear power stations, four. They are um, each of them 1.2 gigawatts, giving you altogether 4.8, is going to be in a place called Al Dabar, and it's a bit west of, of um, Cairo. But I also wanted to draw your attention what is novel, what is innovative that Egypt is doing using only 1% of the thermal waste energy of the reactor, only 1%. They desalinate so much water to a, a point that you can drink it and cook with it and so on. And um, it's a big number. Of course, it's hard to think of such a big number uh, that you see there, 170,000 cubic meters per day, a very, very big number. It's one quarter of the consumption of Cape Town. I mention it because you probably know Cape Town ran out of water and they had to ration people and they couldn't shower and flush their toilets and so on. So, so Cape Town came nearly to day zero, okay? And, and and so uh, this is really putting in context a city, a big city. Uh, so this is only using one quarter percent. So you could imagine they could go to 4% with their one reactor and they could power as a drinking water for a city the size of Cape Town. I think it's showing you the capacity of nuclear power to desalinate. And I think that's very, very, very important. Actually, um, I, I'll say a little bit more about that. But, but um, now here you see they've done the preparation of the site. So this is a year old picture from Facebook. And someone has shown what does the site look like now. They can start building next year. They were just waiting for the regulator to give them the license. And then you're going to start to see the buildings pop up at that site. And you can see it's at the sea and in the desert and so on. And um, everything uh, is looking ready to start building. And I just wanted to, to mention to you about this process heat. There's something very innovative the Russians have done with the Egyptians. And, and I think is like a first for Africa. We just remind the first year physics of uh, thermodynamics. 
that ultimately the efficiency is dependent on the temperature um, on, on the hot side and the cold side, okay, is limiting your efficiency. So normally in a nuclear reactor, you try to have the exhaust temperature as cold as possible. What they've actually done with this reactor is they've increased the temperature of the exhaust, the cold side. They've increased that temperature, which is making the nuclear reactor less efficient, but it does the desalination with its exhaust. So that 1% loss in power capacity is actually lost at the exhaust, the temperature going a little bit higher, but it actually is what enables the desalination. So that overall, this reactor is, is a very interesting, highly efficient overall when you say, well, not only using um, the, the nuclear fuel to generate electricity, but we also generating process heat. So I think you now see the first example on the continent of process heat from nuclear power. So if there are Egyptian people in the audience, you should feel very proud uh, of your country to implement something like this. So now um, there's another thing that's going to constrain us in Africa, okay? This is a picture of the grid in Africa. So please notice how little grid there is. And then you will remember that Egypt has uh, 31 gigawatts and South Africa also has something around that. You can argue, are we 31, 32, 33, whatever. Okay, but um, that's very constrained. So you will probably say Nigeria and th that concentration there in West Africa and, and, and Egypt and the Northern Rim and then down in the South. And then you will come to the conclusion that there's not much load in Africa, not much grid and not much load. And there's um, a, a formula that I've put there that your source must be less than one-tenth of the local connected load that's, that your grid, your local grid can reach. And so I don't think you can go and put a one gigawatt reactor or 4.8 gigawatts like Egypt has done just anywhere in Africa, you can't. Right now, you can't. In the future, yes, we want Africa wealthy. So we're going to be thinking of not only large power in Africa, but we're also going to be thinking of much more grid. And just to explain this, you see the cartoon in the left. You have your generation in the very left, and then you have your transmission, everything in blue. And then you have your distribution, everything in green. The transmission is done at high voltage and the distribution at low voltage. So these are the three components of a power utility, generation, transmission, distribution, and, and try to always think of them together. Often when people talk about putting rooftop renewable, they only think of generation costs they don't think of transmission and distribution. And often the independent power producers, they want to generate. They don't want to be involved in transmission and distribution, but if they generate more than they need, they want to sell back to the grid. And then they do use it, whether they like it or not. Or if for them, the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, they have to take off from the grid. So they are not free from transmission and distribution. It's a very, very important point. You can't say power is only about generation. You must package generation, transmission, distribution together. And to solve the problem, you must have all three. 
So this brings us to really thinking about the grid and then we must keep in mind national grids, mini grids, micro grids. Those are the three kind of grids you can have. And um, if you have renewables in a remote place, yes, you can. You, you can have a local mini or micro grid. That's no problem. And um, it can be still connected as a mini or micro grid onto a national grid. But uh, please keep in mind, wealthy Africa needs 20 times more power. You can't think renewables will save you and will only ever do mini and micro grids. We do need national grids, pan-African grids in Africa. Okay, so now, um, Let's just look a little bit. We're going to start zooming into the SMRs now. So whenever someone is talking about a big reactor, here you see Kuberg's ones. We, we saw the Egyptian one before, but, but in South Africa, Kuberg, you are talking Sorry, Prof, can of I something the in the, yeah. Um, so yeah, I was, I was, when you showed the map of uh, Africa in, in the previous slide, it really looked like there's a there's a shortage of there's there's a huge shortage of infrastructure in terms of grid. So, like, how how big of a problem could this be, and like, how far in the future could Africa start thinking about looking at um, at nuclear power if there's such a shortage of uh, uh, infrastructure like grid infrastructure? I I want to answer that point by proposing small modular reactors. Okay, I will cool. come in that answer. Okay. I just wanted to dispense with the gigawatt size. And, and so I'm just mentioning that the gigawatt size is too big for most of Africa. Egypt can have, South Africa can have, and um, maybe in some high density centers, some other uh, big cities in Africa, they can have, but for the whole of Africa, we're not going to be talking about uh, these big, big gigawatt units. And, uh, and the reason is not only that, so we also, uh, there are other reasons that we will mention uh, why we want small modular reactors. And we want to do nuclear reactors because they're dispatchable. Their load factor is 90%, sometimes 98%. They last 60 to 80 years. They can be refueled once every year, up to once every 10 years. Some models can be refueled once every 80 years. So this, the, the, um, the issue is the nuclear power is there all the time. You, you know, <clears throat> you can go to the wall and push your finger on the light switch. So this is just to emphasize, you know, how impoverished Africa is in energy. This is the watts per person. It's not even a kilowatt uh, per person in South Africa. And then going under 100 watts under a light bulb, one light bulb per person uh, in, in Africa. And then the power outages in Africa, this is the average outages per year, thousands, thousands of, of outages per year in Africa. Go to South Africa and look at our load shedding history, uh, 2019, uh, they don't yet have all the 2020 data, but uh, going even up to stage six in 2019. So power outages and low wattage per person, and then gigawatts installed, okay? We've spoken about South Africa and, and Egypt, but look at the gigawatts installed. If take Senegal, Senegal, okay, is also quite an advanced country, but it's got one gigawatt installed, one gigawatt installed. So you're not gonna meet the criteria if you put in a gigawatt unit in Senegal, that you should be one tenth of the load. Senegal must grow by a factor 10 
in its load before you will come put a gigawatt in and so on. So even Ghana, Mozambique, et cetera, you, you, are, you, you are not going to put in a big reactor there. And now we come to this concept, small modular reactors, okay? And we want to move away from large reactors because in the interim that we don't have wealthy Africa, we still want to deploy nuclear power. So we're going to propose the small modular reactor. And small modular reactors are very, very good for desalination because they can have high temperature exhausts, just like the large cousin in Egypt, the small modular reactors can still do desalination. I'm mentioning the different kinds of um, desalination processes. The one in Egypt was the MED, um, multi-effect dis distillation, but there's a very, very large amount of desalination processes. In this reverse osmosis, you would power the pumps, but you can also have some thermal together with reverse osmosis. But whatever you do, um, your desalination is going to take energy and that energy could be primarily heat, heat around 100 degrees. So um, you will like a energy source that gives you heat. You wouldn't want wind, make electricity, then make heat, you're losing. If, if you have a nuclear reactor, you have process heat there ready and waiting for you. So, so I just want to emphasize um, desalination is going to come as part of the package, okay? Now, um, there are these different kinds of thermodynamic cycles, Carnot cycle, Rankine cycle, Brayton cycle. Basically, um, a Brayton cycle comes like a gas turbine. I'm going to show you one of them. That's the most efficient. And um, it's a it's it's a way to take uh, energy out of the coolant, and it can um, leave you with a high exhaust temperature. So um, some of the small modular reactors are exactly like um, uh, water reactors like the Kuberg one and like the Russian VVER. They are pressurized water reactors and, and they are here called light water reactors. So I think you can think of them as just a small version, a scaled down version of the VVER or Kuberg. And then you're going to see them coming in around 100 megawatts. Now, uh, why are people interested in doing this? Um, first of all, <clears throat> when you have um, a small reactor, it can be an off-the-shelf unit. So it can be pre-built. Like normally when you buy a reactor, no one has built it yet. Then all the different parts have to be manufactured and so on, and there's a long installation time. But if you are selling light water reactors as modules, then you're selling many more modules. So you keep fabricating them, you have them on the shelf and someone comes and just buys them and you just plonk them down. So, so then also the regulatory uh, aspects like I emphasized with um, Egypt's regulator, you, you would have a sign off on the regulation of one of these small ones, and then you would just buy it. So it's like when you go and buy a car, uh, people don't say, oh, this is Ketebi's car. Uh, it, it, it is uh, different um, for, from Paula's car. So um, Ketebi's car's got ABC in, and Paula's car's got DEF in, they are different. No, it, you will go and buy, let's say an Audi A4, and that's what you get, an Audi A4. You don't have another choice. He has an Audi A4, otherwise don't buy it. You can have 
five Audi A4s or three Audi A4s. So, so this would completely change the nuclear industry. Uh, this is the kind of thing, for example, that um, Bill Gates is, is investing in and, and that you hear a lot of excitement around the world about um, modularizing, okay? So this is the light water reactor. But um, I wanted to rather talk about another kind of reactor that um, it, it has been in operation in other countries, uh, but not for power generation. So you maybe know that the Germans had such a um, gas cooled, high temperature gas cooled reactor based on the pebble bed. South Africa bought the patent and took it nearly to completion and then we abandoned it. And the Chinese copied what the South Africans and Germans had done. And they are the ones now sitting with the HTRPM. This is um, the first um, of the new version of the HTGR and it's, it's due to start actually imminently. It's worked in smaller prototypes, but um, it's, it's now almost due to run. And this is a very, very likely reactor that Africa could buy, for example. So the new scale one is quite close to being saleable and also this Chinese HTRPM. In other words, if you were to go shopping now, these are reactors you could place orders for. And so this, this is a um, high temperature gas cooled reactor. So when I say high temperature pressurized water reactor, might, you, you are looking at about 400 degrees centigrade. Here you are looking at about 800 degrees centigrade. Your steam in this one, uh, it can come into your generator at 500, 600 degrees centigrade. So even if you wanted to do a high temperature chemistry, synthetic fuels and um, producing hydrogen and so on, um, these, these reactors could be totally uh, for process heat. In other words, not simply uh, electricity. You could have something that's 100% process heat. So, so those are also uh, very, very big advantages, okay? And um, again, um, Yeah, so, so I want to come now to the braiding cycle and just checking my slides. I think I'm not quite yet at it. So, so these are just uh, different um, thermodynamical cycles that distinguish the HTRPM to this high temperature gas cooled reactor, which has a braiding cycle, is basically something like a jet engine going on inside the reactor. And um, going now to extremely high efficiency and a very, very high grade heat and uh, exhaust at very high temperature still as well. And looking at uh, desalination with no loss of efficiency. So then to summarize, um, when we talk SMR is this range 50 to 200 megawatts, okay? It's like the biggest wind farm. When people build a 100 or 200 megawatt wind farm, they really pat themselves on the back. And it's just one module of a small modular reactor, but for solar or wind, it's lots of square kilometers. So, so this is a, is a very nice, small, uh, compact thing um, off the shelf, uh, hardly any uh, time to installation simplified regulation and and we want to propose for Africa regulate it on a regional basis and coming in with um, very competitive economics but I haven't discussed pricing very much and so um, it is seen now as something that Africa should be looking at and what's very interesting is a few months ago South Africa 
Africa issued a request for information of two and a half megawatts, of which two megawatts were um, the kind of units that you would find at Kuburg, and the other 500 megawatts they're looking at, one of the two options I've just been through, the new scale or um, Sino Power, the Chinese company with the HTRPM. So those are the two companies that can sell you very, very soon, tomorrow, the next day, a um, high temperature gas cooled small modular reactor. And so South Africa, interestingly enough, issued this. So all these requests for information came in about a few weeks ago and our Department of Energy is evaluating them. And it's possible that you will see South Africa build two more units at Kuburg and then start to put in these um, small modular reactors. And you'll see um, where they are possibly going to go, okay? So uh, let's look at them, emerging market opportunities. So you've got lots of coal in Africa, okay? And in South Africa, we also have lots of coal. You might even have lots of gas, you might have whatever, but fossil fuel, coal, okay? And then these power stations might be aging. So they shouldn't last more than about 40 years and they might be really aging. And those are, three that are focused on in South Africa, if you know our power stations, okay? And our utility already called for expression of interest to repower them. What will you repower them with? So basically you've got cities who developed at the coal beds. And those cities, if you turn off the power stations, they got no livelihood and people have got no work, but they all live there. So it's quite an interesting concept to think about, okay, we're not gonna power the power station with coal, but a small modular reactor is just like a kettle. Stick a new kettle element, that's all. Keep the same other stuff and you've got all your grid lines there, tutti frutti, and and then um, you can have your population there. So that's why I think you'll find in South Africa, the trade unions come in behind nuclear power because they really have the capacity to save cities. Save jobs you can reap. So <clears throat> what, how, how do they age? So, so for example, um boiler tube leaks and so on and so that the the thing is just bring along a small modular reactor have another uh, steam generator and then just continue base load power options and now i want to just make you a little bit excited about um what these are looking at there there's this book here i put the 2020 edition. It's called Advances in Small Modular Reactors. I think there's some, there could be 100 of them in this book. It, it, it's absolutely stunning how many startups around the world are getting into the production of, of um, the design and the production of small modular reactors, okay? And I particularly wanted to say to you, what's very nice is three of the projects in this book are actually South African. Now, the, the one that um, is by this chap, Prof. A. Lears, led the team on it, is uh, called the Advanced High Temperature Reactor, okay? And its design goals is the grid demand of the future. That means mini grid, micro grid, national grid, local grid, isolated grid. Um, somewhere like Kola was saying, uh, where there's not a good connections to the outside and so on. You didn't want to put 
renewables there because sometimes people won't have any power at all. So how are you going to help them? You're going to need a small unit, the grid demands of the future. And so you, you want it to fit various size of grids. So this is the modular, put 10, put 20, put only one, and then uh, <clears throat> load following, okay? I spoke of the duck curve in the previous talk, and so you must load follow. You don't want to store electricity. So when no one's using it, you must stop producing it. And when people want it, you must start producing it. So you must load follow like crazy. And, and then uh, simplified construction, uh, inherent safety, very economical, et cetera. Renewable energies are saying they can generate at four cents US per kilowatt hour. That's what they're saying. Big nuclear is coming in at eight cents US per kilowatt hour. Don't forget renewables still have to have 100% backup and much deeper reliance on the transmission and distribution. So you can't just look at the four cents and say, oh, that's what it costs. Nuclear coming in at eight cents doesn't need backup and doesn't need um, a big reliance on the grid. So this, this um, small modular reactor, you really want to compete with renewables claim and bring it down also to um, four cents a kilowatt hour. So here's just a picture. I just want you to look at it. I'll try and draw on the screen. Here's my mouse. Here's the pebble bed. And then you see a turbine, just like a jet engine. So helium is coming in this helium circuit, going through the core and heating up in this uh, turbine. And, and it's turning two compressors. And, and those compressors directly turn a generator. So your first power production is effectively this Brayton cycle jet engine, jet engine, folks, jet engine sitting right here on top of the pebble bed core, turning the first generator. Then you cool your helium in molten salt. So here is molten salt. This is your thermal battery. Then the molten salt does a normal um, uh, uh, superheated steam. Here it heats the steam. And then an, an, an another turbine is here. And then you, dr you drive generator two. So you've got generator one, generator two. And this design is coming from South Africa. The huge innovation is to put this molten salt here. You'll see what magic it does. And another huge innovation, it has no metal pressure vessel. Mm. Can you hear yes, me? Yes, but maybe we were cut. There was a magic part. So did you say something after that, huh? the molten salt? Maybe we were cut. Uh, OK, you hear me now? Yeah. 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 OK, just quick pricey. You have your pebble bed here, which is the nuclear fuel gas flowing through, heating inside a turbine. So basically, this is a jet engine, okay? Like on a jumbo jet, you heat the gas going through the jumbo jet with fuel oh, there. Sorry, yeah. can I please ask a question? Yeah. What happens between the helium that goes into the core and the, uh, pebble bed, the, the, the pebbles inside the core? So helium is inert and uh, it's not very amenable to activation. And so is extremely stable as a cooling gas. Helium is your cooling fluid. There's no water here, it's all helium. 1,200 degrees exit helium. And that first gives some of its energy into a primary 
generator, which is a braking cycle. It's a turbine, turbine, jet engine. And the exhaust of that helium now goes into molten salt. The molten salt isolates all radioactivity. Molten salt is, is not at pressure. So um, you, you can't, it's, it's an enormous uh, safety factor that you can drop the, the pressure of the system from your, your high pressure helium here and come to your molten salt. And now you decouple in the orange and the green, the entire radioactive part, and then you heat your steam by a separate circuit going through the molten salt. And that steam then drives the second turbine. And then there's dry cooling, okay? I hope it didn't break and that you've got all of that. And I wanted to also say, um, does the genius in this design extend also to the, there's no iron pressure vessel. It's concrete, concrete folks. This is just concrete. And uh, engineering of the concrete to be a pressure vessel is very, very, very easy. You can have concrete like this. You can cast concrete on site. You don't need fancy fabrication techniques. Now, the other incredible thing, apart from the no metal pressure vessel, not amenable to radiation damage now, this um, a, um, concrete act also like the shielding. Then um, here you see the gas turbine, the helium expanding in the gas turbine. This is a very wide diameter plug. You can extract this whole unit off for servicing. Inside here are no moving parts, zero moving parts. Uh, it's not a pebble bed with the flow of the pebbles like normal. It's a static pebble bed. And the only moving parts is this gas turbine separate from the pebble beds and you can take it off, unscrew and remove the gas turbine and the generator. So it's, it, its maintenance is extremely uh, simple. So this is one module, okay? Um, there's the heat storage in the second thing, the molten salt. I think I've said enough. Uh, well, um, they're coming to two and a half cents US per kilowatt hour projection in the design. And um, it was at 1,200 degrees. There's new high temperature chemical reactions coming in for desalination and hydrogen production and synthetic liquid fuels uh, from this design. Okay. Um, is a very, very deep burn up. It's a load once fuel cycle. Um, this is thermal stresses, I'm gonna skip past that. I want to talk a little bit about this. So the generator one is the helium turbine. It runs at max power. So you're getting 30 megawatts as a constant yellow line. That's your helium turbine. Now <clears throat> you dump, um, energy into your molten salt as well. And, and this is your molten salt storage. So you're storing in your molten salt and then the whole night long, okay, when we are not on the tail or the head of the duck. So we are nighttime, you, you, the grid is not taken off. So you dump all your energy into the molten salt like concentrated solar. You peak on your molten salt just before the morning peak of, uh, of the duck tail. And now the duck tail morning peak ask for some heat and take it from the molten salt. And then you've got your second um, uh, generator and, and it is actually taking the heat out the molten salt. The second generator is driven from the molten salt. And there you see your molten salt giving off energy uh, so that you follow the duck tail and uh, the duck head. And then um, 
as the molten salt cools down, you are then taking just from your direct cycle. And then as the night comes on, you can start dumping back into your helium, so, uh, into, your, into your molten salt. So, so, so this combination that was dreamed up for concentrated solar is now done for nuclear. So you have nuclear plus molten salt, and then it load follows like crazy while the Brayton cycle is running at constant energy output. And that's the safest and nicest for the nuclear reactor. So that's all on the small modular reactors. This is a, a maybe I just say one more point, the walk away safety. There is no active safety feature in this reactor, zero. So there's nothing you can do if you think there's an accident. It's all there in the physics. Any accident makes the temperature higher. It's already a high temperature reactor. As the temperature increases, the Doppler motion of the uranium in the fuel gets more and broadens the resonances for absorption and gobbles up the neutrons. It always shuts down if it gets too hot. It cannot get too hot. And it's, it's um, all refractory materials. So <clears throat> because it shuts down if it got too hot and it's very hard to start when it's cold, it means that it will passive cool. So, so this is the um, secret then of the walk away safety, not even requiring active safety system. So now um, it's lucky we got that design because this is a very, very frightening picture for South Africa and it will be similar all over Africa where long ago people fabricated all of these fossil fuel power stations and they're going to start coming to end of life. And we've got this famous waterfall curve as they all shut down. So for example, Duva shuts down and Camden we spoke about already shuts down and Orno shuts down and Drina shuts down and so on. And then we built Kosile and Modipe in the last few years and you see Medupe and Kosile help us, but they can't, they're too, too few to stop the waterfall of all the other power stations shutting down. And this is where we are coming to in South Africa, end of life on all previous power stations. And, and so what is going to happen to us? It's a really, really um, scary thing, okay? And yeah, so, so then the proposal would be put small modular reactors there and power those power stations where the, the coal fired power source has, has uh, come to end of term. So now uh, another amazing thing is um, this reactor, it's called Krusty Kilo Power Reactor using Stirling technology. It's operated, it's done its tests, it's, um, our I's dotted and T's crossed and ready to roll. So it's a 10 kilowatt reactor. In um, our house, there's three families and, and we use four to five kilowatts on average per day. We could team up with someone and have one of these. And, and so this is just uh, some specs on its design. Um, one of the things to really speak about is the, st the sterling energy. And uh, it does have control rods, okay? And it has, um, is very, very small. So it needs a beryllium reflector. And then it's got a kind of a passive um, thermosiphon cooling uh, running off sodium. So this is a, a um, Stirling engine, if you have not been familiar with a Stirling engine. The idea of a Stirling engine is that you have one volume uh, which you cool and another volume which you heat, and then the fluid transfers from the one volume to the other. 
And then if you uh, study that, if you continuously cooling one end and heating another, uh, then you are going to have um, a motion like this. So Stirling engines are known to be very efficient and they are um, proposed for aircraft and they're proposed for situations where you don't change the, uh, I would say the power output of it. It's very slow to change the power output because you've got your cold part and your hot part and you can't very quickly change that. So it doesn't really have an accelerator pedal. And there's another version of it, uh, which is this animated GIF on the left there. And so you can stare at that for a while as well and see two pistons, whether one can go through the other. And um, that Stirling engine is a very, very compact one. And that Stirling engine is the one in Krusty. So <clears throat> you will see here that there's a hot part from the reactor core and then there's a radiative umbrella, which is the cold part. So you've got cold and you've got hot, and in between here is the Stirling engine. So you will have power uh, from this um, Stirling engine <coughs> uh, just because you've got hot here and cold here. And uh, it's got this very uh, interesting intrinsic safety that if you um, look and study these, these little cartoons, um, relate to the reactivity uh, coefficient of the reactor. So um, you can design reactors to have this concept called the thermal coefficient of reactivity. That means if the temperature goes up or down, the reactivity will change. Things that will make the reactivity change with temperature is the so-called thermal uh, fission cross-section and thermal absorption cross-section. And normally as physicists, we are not aware that a cross-section depends on temperature, but that's because we always do the scattering experiment to determine the cross-section in kind of like a zero Kelvin conceptual framework. <coughs> For example, if you do a collider experiment, you imagine your target is static and your beam is moving. But in truth, there's thermal motion in your target. So this, the, the uh, conversion from lab to center of mass should average over the thermal energy inside the target. So, so there's like a Debye spectrum of vibrations inside the target. And so actually uh, lab is not the lab because the target is not stationary. And when you take that into account, you have the concept of <coughs> the thermal cross section and that broadens resonances and can um, uh, increase or decrease rates of reactions depending what you do. <coughs> and um, <clears throat> also, you've got the, the thermal expansion, <clears throat> which can change the volume and change the criticality. So in, in this thing, um, if you remove more power from the reactor, then the reactor temperature goes down, then the reactor shrinks, and then the whole uh, fission process more dense, and then the reactivity uh, goes up and then the reactivity, the reactor power goes up. So basically, if you draw more energy out the system, it will ramp up and give you more energy. So this is a, a absolutely uh, amazing way in which you arrange the physics to do the control. And uh, these are tests, warm critical tests, uh, showing the cycling of the fission power in the, in the same antiphase that I was explaining about the, um, the correspondence between extracting power and temperature and the um, change in power of the, 
of the reactor to, to cope so that it was ultimately stable. And, and then um, <clears throat> this is now uh, similar tests that uh, you would need to really go and look at each item uh, in this diagram <clears throat> over all 29 hours. <coughs> Excuse me. And you would see, you would actually see all of those aspects of it that we've been explaining with no active cooling, <clears throat> how the reactor uh, somehow, um, how can I say, the, the reactor controls itself to various uh, fission uh, output conditions. And so uh, it's not a very, very uh, big reactor. So, I mean, here I just took the liberty of using um, Photoshop to put one of the reactors in a house. You know, if everyone wants a little windmill for their house, they can also have a little nuclear reactor for their house. And so um, we've now gone over and uh, looked at solutions for nuclear power going from one kilowatt to several gigawatts. We have seen in the middle that you can have the small modular reactors. These can um, uh, <clears throat> be very, very flexible and just used as a heat source or to um, repower aging coal fleets and so on. Yeah, so now I come to the end. I want to just wrap up. Um, I've put here the things that we've covered um, in, in, in process heat applications. I've mentioned desalination. Um, I've mentioned hydrogen, but I didn't speak much about it, but you can also use the thermal power to extract hydrogen by water splitting. And then you use the so-called fuel cell technology, which is catalytic burning. And just the picture for that is the Ragon plot. It's a very famous plot, okay? And that's why I like a V8 engine, because if you look at where's the best place to be on the Ragon plot, you'll see the internal combustion engine and the gas turbine is the purple up at the top right. When you are plotting specific energy, and that's um, an energy unit per kilogram, and specific power, that's an energy, um, uh, that's a power unit per kilogram. So you're essentially plotting energy versus power per kilogram, okay? So for example, you could look at the capacitors that they are uh, extremely light, <clears throat> and they have a lot of power, but they're very light, so they plot far to the right, but then they can't keep you with a lot of energy and so on. So you can just stare at this diagram, it's really fantastic. And then um, the contours are to arrange everything at how long it takes to charge. So the combustion engine, they say you go to the petrol station for six minutes and you have put more petrol in your tank. And then um, <clears throat> the other things take much longer to charge, be they batteries or the fuel cell, because you, you know, to transfer hydrogen can take also a long time. So that is a very nice summary and then it can show you where everything is. And because the combustion engine's looking so good, we really have to think of liquid synthetic fuel as an energy carrier. And, and so I put there an example from the Greens where they use solar energy, um, but you could say, okay, I won't do it with solar, I'll do it with a small modular reactor. So where they put plentiful sunshine, imagine we will put small modular reactor, okay? And they're calling it liquid sunshine and it's done. You can, you can have a thing like this, you can buy it. And it will take carbon dioxide from the air. So it's just grabbing carbon dioxide from the air and sequestering it to extract carbon 
Bye-bye oxygen, just like a tree. It's doing photosynthesis. So you just uh, need a high temperature and for that they use uh, sunshine, concentrated solar. And then <clears throat> you are planting a tree essentially when you have this. And then you extract hydrogen from water and you combine the hydrogen and carbon and you, you make um, hydrocarbons. So for example, alcohol in this case. And then you would have alcohol or some derivative of that to fuel your car. So for me, that's really the future. Um, if, if you had a plentiful energy, I don't care there if it's solar, but you could also imagine small modular reactor. And then <clears throat> I put there at the top, climate control and terraforming because then you would actually say, okay, how much carbon dioxide do I want in the air? How much do I want? Do I want more? Do I want less? And then if you want less, you take it out the air and you turn it into liquid synthetic fuel. And after you've used the liquid synthetic fuel, it goes back to where it came from. So it's totally carbon neutral, totally. And, and so uh, this, this, I think, shows that technology can and will solve the climate problem. This is done, folks. You can buy these things. And, 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 um, and so that means that if you have a car, it's like you have planted a tree. You're doing what nature's doing. So, so um, all we really need is this concept of process heat. And that's really why I strongly say we don't want to think of a low energy future. We want to think of terawatts. And the final uh, slide is this one. And this one blows my mind. And um, so I have a colleague and he's trying to promote the concept of the water grid, not just the electrical grid. Now we already believe in the electrical grid. You, you have your power stations and then you have a grid and the grid takes the power. Whoever wants power, please come to the grid and get the power. Same with water. All you need is to pump it and to have a pipeline. And then you could have exactly the same thing as the electrical grid. You could have a water grid. So you could have your desalination and you could have your water grid. It's entirely possible that on planet Earth, we do not need to be at day zero ever. No city needs to run out of water. You can have your water be you in a desert city or wherever. So what do you need to have a water grid? To, to have a water grid, you need a pump. To, to work the pump, you need energy. So, so that's why the future that we are looking at is actually uh, a, a future with a lot of energy. So I want to end there. Uh, the answer is now yes. Nuclear energy in the mix will promote sustainable and viable Africa. Thank you. Um, Simon, thanks for that uh, comprehensive uh, overview. Um, I will say so anybody has uh, any question any for the discussion material. Uh, Simon, the issue of the of the renewables, I think you pointed out that uh, if people really want to just uh, just uh, want to do this uh, as a private uh, way of uh, contributing to the energy needs, that is fine. But uh, could you comment on that a little more? Because um, um, you know, Africa is already relying heavily on fossil fuel. A lot of the traditional cooking and, and heating stuff are based on charcoal 
which then also really affect the environment and also has a pollution part of uh, uh, some people who die of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning from all of these unburned materials that are being used uh, sometimes in confined spaces. Um, and, and in fact, it's quite a large fraction. Um, I mean, I know, for example, the village that I'm, I come from when I was growing up, we have no electricity. It's coming now, but still a large number of people are still using charcoal for cooking. Um, those people, for example, could benefit if they have, a, I don't know, um, a small um, solar energy station on top of the houses. Um, if, though, if, if, if something like that could be really cheap or it could even be encouraged, it will help a lot. Even using gasoline is a problem. I, I think if you go to low-made now, you have uh, all of these, uh, you know, um, uh, motorbike taxis. And, uh, you know, they pollute the environment like crazy. So you can basically get on a motorbike, they will take you from point A from point B. It's like, you know, the entire country or city is completely flooded with this stuff and they're just, you know, a huge source of pollution. So the fossil fuel also are really a problem. Africa produces a huge quantity of fossil fuel. Nigeria has huge reserve. So we have uh, Libya, Algeria, uh, we have uh, Gabon. Uh, recently, a huge uh, reserve has been found off the shore of uh, Ghana, Togo, and Benin. These countries are fighting over it right now, how to share it. But however, we don't refine any of those. They go back to Europe, and, uh, and then we get the refined gasoline bag that is sold to us. It's really appalling that the country of like Nigeria sometimes just run out of gasoline and all the cars are completely at a standstill with all of these things that all of the reserve that is producing and exporting. So I have the feeling that before we even get to the nuclear aspect, there is there's probably an intermediate steps where the renewable can actually serve as a cornerstone of the development or the drive, and also the, the fossil fuel can also play a role in, in the development um, to reach the, that, uh, that goal of the, of the nuclear. Um, could you comment on all of this issue a little bit? I think why it's been nice to give this talk is it comes back so strongly. People are so wedded to renewables. So last talk and this talk, people very strongly wedded to renewables. But we need to look at the evidence. There have been renewables now for 20 years. And no country dominates in terms of renewables. I showed the one graph that the carbon-free domination is hydro and nuclear. There is not car carbon-free domination by renewables. Lots of talk, lots of fanfare, but, but there is not. And one of the world's richest nations is Germany. And in political reasons after Fukushima, they shut down their nuclear and put lots of renewables. Now, if it's true what you are saying, that renewables can really fill the gap. Why is Germany's power now three times more expensive? It's because of the intermittency of the renewables. It's because of the costs that are hidden. Because of that intermittency, you need the backup. And the backup is very expensive. And <clears throat> the renewables themselves, by being intermittent, there's not yet a technology to deal with the, the leveling of the renewables. That was, I was really trying to explain the time scales over which it's variable. And, and so you can look at Spain, you can look at California, you can look at Australia, you can look at Germany, no one managed. 
that every country that went for political reason to large amount of renewables had a terrible grid failure. There have been, um, what, what is that thing called? Um, load shedding in California, a very, very rich country. If, if a rich country is going to go into load shedding because the sun didn't shine and the, and, and the wind didn't blow, then <clears throat> the penetration of renewables, their calculations that show when you go above 20, 30% renewables, that's too much variability. The grid can't take it. You age your grid. It doesn't want to go um, up and down, up and down, up and down like that. The, the uh, thermal cycling on your base load power is tremendously aging effect on it. So um, Australia then said it's capping renewables at 30%. Now Germany still is mostly governed by politics and they pushing ahead with their 100% renewables. And what's going to happen is German companies will have to relocate to other countries because at the end of the day, you can't sell your Mercedes Benz if no one wants to pay the cost of your electricity to make that Mercedes Benz. So the world at the moment is having a love affair with renewables, which is not backed up by evidence. It's yeah, not. So, but Simon, could you also comment on the fossil fuel? Because it's, I mean, don't you agree that it's really, really appalling that Africa should be self-sustaining with all of the fossil fuel reserve that we have. Nigeria itself can power Africa completely and we don't yes. even have so to I, pay one cent for, for, yes. for, for gasoline, you know, but we are in a mess where Europe and America takes all of our fuel and then resell it to us at a very, very high cost. Uh, and and right. all of the pollution stuff. I, I think, I think there, those are endemic systemic legacies about colonialism and so on, um, ongoing dysfunctionality and so on. I, I, I have to say I'm in the camp. I feel very strongly that, it's just a hobby horse of mine, but I feel very strongly that the legacy of colonialism and, and the uh, fact that Africa is less in a vacuum. So if there's a resource in an African country, you can hardly keep your democracy. Because some dumb brigand or opposition grouping to take over power and you don't hear I just uh, to cut a long story short I think Africa can't go on the road to democracy without tremendous interference from foreign concerns and I think that plays a lot in what you have just said about the dysfunctionality of the fossil fuel in Nigeria. The other part of your question was, what is the interim solution? I feel the interim solution is mini grids and small modular reactors. For example, even if you brought a wind farm to a village, you would have to put power lines. You would have to put transformers. So you're going to have to do distribution. You're going to have to do a mini grid. No one will get away from the concept of a mini grid. Now, if you have a mini grid, you then have the choice. Either you put a windmill to uh, a, a bunch of windmills or solar farm to power the mini grid or a small modular reactor. Then what we are saying is look at the world. Whoever put the windmill and solar farm, their electricity price went up. Why must the poor pay more just because you want to sell a renewable? Please put a small modular reactor 
at the very self same mini grid. And then let everyone have clean power there 100% of the time, and then gradually build up your, your, your grid throughout Africa. So when you say interim solution to be renewables plus mini grid, I'm saying small modular reactor plus mini grid. So I, I would say it's uh, complementary, so it doesn't replace. I mean, what Ketavi means is that I think, and I also believe that for the photovoltaic, there is a chance, there is all the possibility as well to have this sun and then to develop and push for innovation. So this is something which is really good. So if Africa can do this with the photovoltaic, because there are a lot of little villages that will get as well the possibility to benefit 100% on that, and then on the other side, because for the wealth of Africa, you need for sure to have sustainable energy, exactly like what you are presenting. This is such a brilliant concept. I really like this idea as well of, uh, of having this, uh, this uh, the concept of process heat and all those different stages with the molten soil. That's really novel as well. And this could be applied maybe starting by richer country or country that have as well this capacity and then going little by little with uh, within the rest of Africa, but it has to be Pan-Africa as well. So that's one of the things that you mentioned. Now, so this should be something that goes together, even if a lot of the power, a lot of the, the politics should first, of course, put the money with uh, the, the development of, uh, of all the, um, I mean, the, the, the process uh, that you are speaking about. But still, when you think about the lobbyism, or I guess that this is also what Ketavi was mentioning with the, the, the problem of uh, the oil or, or, or all the fossil fuels, so those things has to be as well cleared up in another way. But for me, it's, it's another, another area, another, maybe the same political interest, but still a plan should be clearly with different people and making sure that there is not too much importance of the lobbyism or if you manage to have the politics just deciding as well on this sustainable solution for what you are describing with this modular reactor when there is sufficient support so then you can really work to have a, a fully independent Africa, but it cannot be before. So you need first to have a wealthier Africa, exactly. And for that, you need more energy consumption in one sense without destroying the environment though. So still by keeping innovation development for all those photovoltaic for instance, or the wind. But I agree that the, the, the green electricity or, or neutral, like what we are trying to do in Scandinavia, that's not adapted at all for Africa. I mean, it's not so good. There's so many other things for us to deal with in Africa. So yeah, so yeah, I can see important. that people are very, very, very uh, married to trying to keep renewable, but I'm pretty sure that whoever goes the renewable route will be slower than whoever goes the small modular reactor route. The country <clears throat> that says, you know, it's not a chicken and egg. First have wealth, then have energy, whatever. You say, no, it's not a chicken and egg. We are government. We are going to choose to prioritize small modular reactors. That will make business. Once, once someone has electricity and then their computer is always on, uh, they, 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 they can have their shop working 100%, they can ultimately be industry, etc. I I think that I would put down a power infrastructure just as a enormously high priority and then there is going to become wealth that for sure i wouldn't say first africa get a bit more wealthy and then we do it so i would urge african governments as soon as possible to start establishing mini grids can be disconnected from each other and put a small modular reactor there 
Let some say, oh, we don't believe you. We will put wind, we will put solar, fine. But the evidence, in my opinion, does not show that. And I think that whoever spend a long time discussing and looking at numbers and so on, and, and it shows in our book, we will do a 10 times bigger effort to really bring this out with data, is that the wind and the solar remain a myth. If, if ever you've had to charge your cell phone uh, from a solar power, you will start to realize how, how, how unreliable a solution it is. Um, one of my colleagues, he had a small holding and, and he spent an enormous amount and he put 200 square meters of solar on his roofs and he put um, a kind of a hydrogen fuel cell technology for a battery and he didn't need the grid, but you had to be very rich to afford that. Very, very, very rich. It was nowhere near this um, four US cents per kilowatt hour. You had to be very, very rich. And I'm, I'm convinced that it's much more expensive to go renewables plus storage not renewables, renewables plus storage. It's much more expensive than to go small modular reactor. And people will understand this, even in Africa where they say it's so sunny and there's so, such high wind potential. There also was in Spain, there also was in California, there also was in Australia and it didn't work out. So the numbers are not showing that they are not. And those numbers are available and, and, and uh, people can look at those numbers. So I think I will tell my group that we will do a 10 times better job to really show with the numbers that uh, renewables are not delivering the goods, not even in Africa. Then that will be very sad if particular country says, let's do renewables and spends its money there. And then it didn't manage to solve the problem. I, I visited a remote school in a mountain and Denmark had paid, was in Swaziland. Denmark had paid hundreds of thousands of euros and they had put windmills up. And not one of the days that I was there for about four days, could they run their computer center? Not, not one of the days. So I couldn't do computers. And, uh, and, and so I said, that's wonderful that you bought wind power. They had a whole energy group at the school. Said, now what you have learned is you shouldn't have bought wind power. That's what I think is people are going to learn. The Germans have learned. This, they this, don't want this, to listen. This, this is politics. I, I agree with that. It's just kind of, I mean, I'm also very upset with what Denmark is doing in any case. And, and I see that this is a fact. But first, it has to be the wealth of the country so that they can as well invest and have something that we don't depend 100%. But that could be a way towards some, uh, some, some sustainability. But they are still with Denmark. Uh, they're still pushing towards having more of those linear, having more of the photovoltaic as well. Mm. Yes, I think, I think it's very seductive because you look out, the sun is shining, it's free. The wind is blowing, it's free. So then you think, wow, that looks fantastic. It's much better than oil. I have to pay for that. Look, there's all that sunshine, free, God gave it. All that wind, lovely. But the problem is it's such a scarce resource and you have to harvest it with lots of plant and it's intermittent. But one of the, the areas, that's why I was speaking about the innovation still. So agree with the wind, but now think about the photovoltaic because there, this is really where Africa could make a difference as well. 
So, so to use as well some development, it's maybe not in your field, but then some other university or part of research could really make a difference and an added value for having more development that they could apply directly. And this is again, not incompatible. You would have with the, there is only with your concept uh, with this modular reactor that you would have enough quantity, but with the flexibility or with this innovation or with this other aspect as well of energy, then Africa could have a, a much bigger uh, bandwidth in terms of the type of energy that they could provide. So this is why I think it, it's important as well for you yeah, not to, to, to just uh, make, uh, to, to take it out of your plate, just to make sure that uh, you don't have uh, additional enemy from not uh, going for uh, some green energy. Because it's important to play as well with them because they are, they, they will be listening a lot in the future. So be aware, of course. <laughs> but but I, I'm pretty sure we can say mix just so that yes. The politics is okay, but I'm pretty sure that the future will judge us harshly for messing around with wind and solar for baseload. As I don't want to rule it out if you go camping or, or if there really is a, a very, a very isolated clinic or who knows what, you know. But um, but there, there also are on nuclear batteries, not only, you know, other kinds of batteries. So, so but, but nonetheless, um, if, if it was right that wind and solar were cheaper and better, then you wouldn't have seen the results you've seen in the countries that I've mentioned, is someone has to, to explain the electricity price going up a factor of three in Germany. They have to explain that. It will take time. And we need still to find better way to transfer, I mean, to stock uh, the energy. That's one of the big thing, of course. So with uh, neutron source or with light source, we'll get some better way as well to understand how to store the energy. To have huge, yeah. but so, that could be a future. Uh, guys, okay, I think uh, it's really a very good discussion, but uh, in the interest of time, we have gone over two hours now. Um, you know, I, well, at least we are getting, getting close to two hours. I suggest that we stop uh, here. Um, I think this certainly, um, you know, the progress of Africa does require that we address the energy issue quite well. And uh, I think the presentation by Professor Simon Conner is really inspiring. Um, nevertheless, uh, I would suggest that uh, we stop here. I don't know about you, but I have been uh, in meetings uh, since uh, six o'clock my time, yeah, it's almost 12 right now. I do need some energy in my body to keep going. So. <laughs> so on that note, I will suggest that we stop here now. And I, 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 I would like to thank everybody. Thank you very much. Very Perfect. nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Very interesting. Bye. Bye. Bye.